Hi, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you're all well. Um, first, let me just announce, yeah, that as always, uh, this Tuesday share is uh, sponsored for the entire year uh, by Rabbi Foyle and Sherman Alman in memory of their parents, Edith and Reiner Alman, Zechonon Levracha, Yona Ben Sadok, and uh, Esther Basra Foyle, and their son, Rabbi Shmuel Elio Alman, Rabbi Shmuel Elio Ben Rabbi Rafael. Uh, may all of this learning be uh, le'iloi uh, nishmatam. Uh, hope everybody's well, and again, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming out. Um, I thought uh, for this week and next week we'll talk about Hanukkah, kind of a little bit of a, a digression. But again, I always give my warning: this is a no inspiration zone. So uh, this is not about inspiration. This is about the dryness of halacha. But maybe accidentally, some inspiration might might. <laughs> leak in, but uh, it's, an, it's an unintentional consequence. There are other shiurim, uh, including things that I give, that go off on those things, but this is mainly uh, analytical halacha. But first, I want to start off with a very, very simple question. Uh, there is a holiday called Hanukkah coming up. Uh, it is not a Yom Tov in the sense that you're allowed, you're allowed to do malacha, but it's considered to be festive. We say Hallel for eight days. We have special insertions uh, in the Shemona Esrei and in Birkat HaMazon. That's called the Al Hanisim. So the question becomes, why is there a holiday of Hanukkah? And if you ask most people, they're going to say right off the bat that it commemorates a miracle of oil that was found, uh, enough oil uh, to only burn one day, and it burned eight days, and therefore we commemorate the miracle by Adlaka Teneros, and that is why we have the holiday of Hanukkah. So here is the thing. There are a lot of problems with what you might call the standard conventional explanation of why there's a holiday of Hanukkah. Mm. First, it's a well-known question that if you look at the al Hanisim prayer, now the al Hanisim prayer is very, very old. We don't have an exact date, but it may date shortly after the Maccabean victory. So it goes all the way back. Uh, the al Hanisim prayer emphasizes really 95%, 98%, the Nitzachon over the Yavanim. It says, Masarta, you gave Giborim, Biat Chaloshim, the strong in the hands of the weak, a Tzadikim, a Rishayim in the hands of the Tzadikim, the impure in the hands of the pure. So the emphasis is on the Nitzachon of the Milchama, as well as the rededication of the Beis HaMikdash. And even though there is indeed one reference to lighting the neros. It says, Vidliku neros. They lit the candles of the menorah. V'chatzros katshecha in your holy courtyard. But it doesn't talk about it as a miracle. It's really just describing. We dedicated the temple, we cleaned it up, and we were able to light the menorah. In other words, you can't really read any type of miracle story in the reference to al because it doesn't mention any miracle. It doesn't mention they only lit, you know, uh, oil for one day and it burned for eight days. So the Pashtas is, if you look at the al you're really commemorating really two related ideas. One is the uh, overthrow of Malchus Yavan Harisha'ah that tried to take us away from the Torah, Lashkicham Torah And the second point is the rededication and cleansing of the Beis HaMikdash, which for three years had been held by the Yavanim. For three years, the Yavanim had control of the Beis HaMikdash. They sacrificed idolatrous uh, <coughs> korbanos uh, and the like. Uh, they even had houses of prostitution. And therefore, there was a cleansing that had to take place. In fact, there actually was a special room in the Beis HaMikdash post-Hanukkah where they kept the Avne Mizbeach that had been desecrated by the Malcha Yavan, meaning they actually had to undo the Mizbeach and those old stones, which kind of got contaminated to Avodah were kept as a memorial in a chamber. Avanim Sheshiktsu Yavan, that Yavan had despicably treated. So it's very clear, number one, from the Al Hanisim, that the holiday of Hanukkah is not because of the miracle of the Pach Hashem. Now, we can prove this even more so because the earliest account of the Hanukkah story is in, uh, earlier than the Gemara, earlier than the Mishnah, is actually the books that are known as the Sefer HaMakabim, the books of the Maccabees. It's a little confusing because it goes by two titles. Uh, say, there's Sefer HaMakabim, and actually there are four of them. 
There's Makabim Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalit. And sometimes they are called Sefer Chashmonaim. Again, Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalit. Sefer Chashmonaim and Sefer Hamakabim are the same book. The original name is Sefer Hamakabim for various reasons. In the 19th century, uh, someone decided to rename, rename the books. Now, just a little bit of bibliographical information here that, that might be important for you. Uh, do not confuse Sefer HaMakabim with another short, very short work that's called Megillas Antiochus. Megillas Antiochus, which actually appears in some Sidurim, not that many, but some older Sidurim have Megillas Antiochus. Megillas Antiochus is a short work, and some Kehilot actually had the minag of reading it on Hanukkah in Shul by parallel to Megillah Esther. Megillah Esther, we read about the Purim miracle. Why they call it Megillah Santiochus, I don't know. You normally want to, maybe you should call it Megillah Yehud HaMakabi or something. But it's called Megillah uh, Antiochus. And that's a short work. Uh, and there's a huge machlokus. There are many inconsistencies between Sefer HaMakabim and Megillah Santiochus. Uh, some may put Megillah Santiochus very, very early. But most historians say Megillus Antiochus is late. It's a medieval, a Middle Age, uh, Ages rendition of the story of, of Hanukkah. And therefore, if there is any conflict between Sefer HaMakabim, which is very old, and Megillus Antiochus, you normally follow the Sefer HaMakabim. Now, it's interesting that Sefer HaMakabim is not in Tanakh, of course, but it is in what we call the Apocrypha, or Svarim Chitzonim, the excluded works that are not in Tanakh, because after all, the whole story of Hanukkah is after uh, the period of prophecy. There's no more, and there's no more any prophecy. This is during the Bayat Sheni. The last prophets were the very beginning of the Bayat Sheni, Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi, and the story of Hanukkah is afterwards. The story of Hanukkah is approximately in the 180s before the Common Era. That's the, the general uh, story of Hanukkah. Now, in the Sefer HaMakabim, uh, so as I said, you have Aleph, Beis, Gimel, Dalet. The story of the wars against Antiochus and his successors are, are in Maccabees 1 and 2. Gimel and Dalet are really kind of philosophical works. Uh, they're not really connected to the history of the period. They are different debates between Hellenism and Judaism, etc. So when we talk about the history of the Hanukkah period, we are looking at Maccabees 1 and 2. And these are big books, uh, and they really give you maybe more detail than you might be interested in, unless you're a military historian. They go over every single battle, every single milchama. In fact, I, I'm told that there was a time in West Point where they actually studied the books of the Maccabees to understand the nature of guerrilla warfare, because in, in, during Vietnam, one of the amazing things was that here you had the United States Army, the most powerful army in the world, and then you had these uh, farmers, uh, in the rice paddies, and somehow this little guerrilla army was able to defeat. Okay, technically, we never called it a defeat, but practically it certainly was a defeat. It was. was able to defeat the United States of America. And uh, the answer is that Bedere Chateva, you know, guerrilla fighters who are committed to a cause can defeat even big armies. And one of the great historical examples of that, if you take out religion, which of course we don't take out religion, we take out religion, was the story of the Maccabees defeating the Greek army. So I am told that during the 1970s, the books of the Maccabees were studied in West Point to try to understand the nature of guerrilla warfare and how it could defeat a much more powerful enemy. Now, <coughs> It's interesting that the book of the Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2 largely go over the same history, but it has a little bit of a different emphasis. Maccabees 1 emphasizes military strategy. It emphasizes the koach of milchama and nitzachon. Maccabees 2 emphasizes the martyrdom of Jews who were willing to die al Kiddush Hashem. Now, now, here's an important point. Both Maccabees 1 and 2 are religious books. It's not that one is secular and one is religious. 
They both talk about Hashem as the source of victory. They both talk about tefillah to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Right? They're both religious books. But Mitzad Klal Yisrael, what is the main thing that you emphasize? So Maccabees 1 emphasizes the Gevurah of Milchama. Maccabees 2 emphasizes the Mesiras Nefesh of Klal Yisrael who were willing to die. So the famous story of Chana and her seven sons, all of whom were killed, is in Maccabees 2. The source of the story is in Sefer HaMakabim Bet. It's very, very interesting that these books were originally written in Greek. Uh, they were written in Greek because, unfortunately, Hellenism was so successful that even the winning side, the Torah side, had to often communicate things in Greek. And therefore, the Hebrew versions that we have are translations from what were originally Greek works. And that is why there was a certain ambiguity to this very day. What does the word Maccabee mean? Right? Matisio's army were called the Maccabim. Now, how do you spell Maccabim in Hebrew? Is it with a Chaf, Mem Chaf Beis Yod, or Mem Kuf Beis Yod? Now, if it's Mem Chaf Beis Yod, it is said to be an abbreviation uh, that they had on their banner, Mi Kamocha Ba'elim Hashem, who is like you, God, uh, which is from the Shira Sayam. Uh, if, on the other hand, it is with a kuf, the word makevet means a sledgehammer. And it suggests their might and their prowess. So there's a machlokas, machlokas among commentators and meforshim. If makabim is a chaf and it's mi kamocha ba'ilam Hashem, or makabim is with a kuf and it represents makevet. So you may ask a very simple question. Well, what, how does the book of Maccabees spell it? But the answer is, you can't really tell because in Greek, you wouldn't know. In other words, it doesn't tell you why. It just says, they were called the Maccabim. But in Greek, I can't tell if it would be a kuf or a chaf. And therefore, when they translate it in Hebrew, different Hebrew translations translate it in different, in different ways, right? Because it was originally a Greek, a Greek uh, work. Now, uh, so the point is, both books uh, are filled with amuna, filled with tefillah, filled with turning to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But the question is, what is the heroic aspect that you emphasize? The military gevura, the courage of the chayal, or the person who gives their life al Kiddush Hashem? Now, it's very, very fascinating that we have that same debate, so to speak, in the aftermath of the Shoah, the aftermath of the Holocaust. And it's very, very fascinating how something that was an old debate resurfaced. You know, as, as you know, a Yom HaShoah uh, in Eretz Yisrael, also in Chutz Laretz as well, a day that commemorates the Holocaust is in the month of Nisan, which is, a, again, that's a halachic question, not supposed to have sad days in Nisan, but uh, the date that is chosen commemorates the fall and defeat of the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, you would think that Holocaust commemoration, unless you're crazy in the Karta, it would not be controversial. I mean, everyone mourns over the Shoah, of course, but I, hope, I don't know if you know this, but the, the choice of that date, uh, going all the way back to the early 1950s, was very, very contra- controversial. And it engang- engendered a lot of bitterness among many Holocaust survivors who were still alive back in the 1950s. And I don't just mean the halachic problem of observing a Yom HaShoah in Nisan. That, that, I mean, that's a halachic problem, that's a separate matter. But it's because why was the Warsaw Ghetto chosen because among many Zionists they actually were ashamed I'm not saying everybody but there actually was a sense of shame for the Jews who passively went to their death like sheep because part of the militarism of the new state of Israel was we're tough, we're strong, we don't get pushed around never again and it was the gullus mentality of Jews who passively went to their death like sheep to the slaughter and were embarrassed. Why didn't they fight more? So, to commemorate the Shoah, they were looking for one of the relatively few instances where Jews were able to be militant, although they were eventually crushed, and that is the Warsaw Ghetto, because that was the paradigm of what you might call a military heroism. Uh, and that's why they celebrated it. Now, 
there were many in the Holocaust community, again, uh, who, who actually felt that this was an implicit and maybe an explicit judgment of condemnation with respect to all the Jews who were not able to fight back, who didn't have the weapons, who didn't have the abilities. And therefore, everything in Israel becomes a machlokas, right? You, you figure, Yom HaShoah has to be a machlokas? Yeah, it was, it was a machlokas. And what's interesting to me is, this actually mirrors or echoes the debate between Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2, going back to the Chashmanoim. What do we remember about the greatness of Am Yisrael? That they fought against this enemy or that they were willing to die al Kiddush Hashem. So the two different authors were viewing the Maccabee struggle through three different prisms. Now, of course, the true answer is we commemorate both. We honor both. Uh, it, it shouldn't have to be an either or type of issue. Right? We honor the courage and strength of the fighters of the Warsaw Ghetto. And we honor the people who went to their deaths because there was nothing else they can do. But they accepted their fate in life because they understood that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. Everybody, there's an, you know, everyone has to be honored. Everyone has to be cherished. But you can imagine at different times in history there were, were machloksim, what point you should emphasize. So it seemed to me, I didn't see anyone else point this out, but it seems to me that the debate, there is a debate here between Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2. And that debate found a later expression in Yom HaShoah, which still goes on uh, to, this, uh, to this very day. Um, now, both of them go over a lot of the same history, and they talk about the fact that the Yavanim had control of the Beit HaMikdash for three years, and interestingly enough, the day they gained control of the Beit HaMikdash was the 25th of Kislev, meaning the day that later became Hanukkah, was actually the day that they gained control of the Beit HaMikdash, and they desecrated it, they contaminated it, they didn't destroy it, the building remained, but they sacrificed chazerim, they sacrificed pigs on the, on the Mizbeach, and they sacrificed, of course, to Avodah Zorah, they put up houses of prostitution, all sorts of desecrations. Um, it's even brought down that... Uh, they, 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 they breached the walls and fences, uh, and uh, later the Chachamim were Mesakein, that to commemorate the 13 breaches of the Yavanim, there are 13 places in the base of Mikdash where you bow down to commemorate that God saved us from all of this. Now, in both Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2, there is not even a mention of a miracle of Pach Hashem. In Maccabees 1, it says... They created the holiday of Hanukkah because when they liberated the Beis HaMikdash, they had an eight-day dedication ceremony. Again, simple meaning. The word Hanukkah means dedication. And this commemorates Chanukat Habayat. That was eight days. Not, not because of the oil burning eight days, but because the Chanukat Habayat was eight days. Why was the Chanukah Tabayat eight days? So the book of Maccabees says to parallel the dedication of the Mishkan in the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. The Mishkan essentially had an eight-day cer- uh, dedication ceremony. There were seven preliminary days and then Yom HaShmini, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, was the dedication of the Mishkan. That was the day, unfortunately, that Nodav and Aviyu died, but still eight days. Now, here's an interesting question. I think we have to supplement Maccabees 1 with the following idea, and that is, Shlomo HaMelech built the first Beis HaMikdash, and his dedication ceremony was not eight days. His, cere- his dedication ceremony was 14 days. In fact, uh, one of those days was Yom Kippur. In fact, uh, Chazal actually say that it was 14 days of celebration that year, they even ate on Yom Kippur. Up through prophetic uh, rishos, harat sha'ah, temporary suspension of the rules. So here's the question. If the Maccabim are dedicating, uh, actually, uh, there are a few interesting things. First of all, the dedication of the Maccabees is not the dedication of the second temple, it's the rededication of the second temple. Who dedicated the second temple? It actually was Ezra and Nehemiah. 
so so one interesting question is, we don't we don't commemorate that at all. Number one, we don't com- well. Number one, we don't commemorate Chanukah Samishkan. We don't commemorate Chanukah by its Rishon. We don't even commemorate Chanukah by its Sheni. We only commemorate the rededication, right? Because the base of Mikdash had already been up for more than a hundred years before the story of Antiochus. So that's an interesting point. But the second point is. Why did the Maccabees choose eight, the eight-day dedication of Moshe Rabbeinu rather than the 14 days of dedication of Shlomo HaMelech? So the actual answer is based on a Medrash Pesikta. The Medrash Pesikta says that when the Jewish people began constructing the Mishkan, and they, when did they begin constructing the Mishkan or donating to the Mishkan? The day after Yom Kippur. Moshe gathered them the day after Yom Kippur when he came down with the second Luchos and said, we've got to build a Mishkan because Hashem has forgiven us and he's going to rest his Shekhinah in Klal Yisrael. So they actually were finished Hanukkah time, or, or the month of Kislev. They were finished in the month of Kislev. But Hashem wanted to delay the dedication of the Mishkan until Nisan, because that is the birth of Yitzchak Avinu, and Yitzchak is the pillar of Avoda, divine service. And therefore Hashem wanted the Mishkan to be dedicated in Nisan, which it was. Actually, the last week of Adar, Chaf Gimel Adar, but the, the final day of dedication was Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So the month of Tishrei was upset, whatever that means. He said, hey, you took away the dedication from me. So Hashem said, I promise you, that you will be the month in which the Bayat Sheni will be rededicated. So based on this Medrash Pesikta, it's a beautiful connection that Kislev becomes the month of dedication to make up for the fact that it should have been the Zman of the dedication of the Mishkan. So consequently, how long will the dedication ceremony be? Eight days, exactly as the dedication of the Mishkan. So, Maccabees 1 does not mention a miracle of Pach Hashemen, and it does not mention that Hanukkah was established for that reason. Rather, Hanukkah doesn't even say Chanu Chafei. It doesn't say they rested on the 25th. That's a later drush. It simply says, this is a ce- celebration of the dedication of the Beis HaMikdash after it had been desecrated by the Yavanim. And why do we have eight days? We have eight days because this was the Chanukah of Moshe Rabbeinu in the Mishkan. Now, Maccabees 2 gives another reason for eight days. That's a little peculiar. And it says that the Sukkos preceding that Chanukah, right, Sukkos is, uh, you know, less than two months before, around two months before uh, Chanukah, uh, they weren't able to be all their regal. They couldn't make a pilgrimage because the Yavanim were in control of the Beis HaMikdash. They missed, of course, they missed many Shalosh Regalim over three years, but the last one they missed was Sukkos, and therefore they enacted Hanukkah, eight days, to be a makeup for the Sukkos that they missed. And Sukkos is technically, well, seven days plus Shmini Atzeret. <coughs> So we look at Sukkot as more or less an eight-day holiday. Now, Maccabees 2 even says, and this is very strange, and this is one of the reasons why these apocryphal books are not accepted in Tanakh, because they're not always in accordance with Halacha, that the Jews even built Sukkot, and they took Lulav and Esrog, because Hanukkah was enacted to be a substitute, or a makeup, a makeup, for Sukkot. Now, obviously, halachically, uh, that is uh, meaningless. Uh, the only thing that you can make up, you can make up Pesach Sheni. If you didn't bring a Korban Pesach, you can bring it a month later. But you can't make up Sukkot. You can't make up uh, eating matzah, right? You can't make up, I mean, you miss it, you miss it. And if you couldn't do it, you're putter, but you can't make it up. So this was not anything that was done, I'll pee the Chachamim. This was a folk reaction, meaning people on their own spontaneously wanted, they were so connected to the mitzvot of Sukkot that they spontaneously 
began doing Sukkos things. And this is recorded in the book of the Maccabees. What is fascinating is that even things that kind of get extinct, meaning the Chachamim didn't pay attention to this. Uh, this never became part of Jewish halacha. But it pops up a little bit. Sometimes remnants pop up when you wouldn't expect it. Um, I'm sure you remember there's a famous machlokas Beishamay and Beishelel. How do you light the Hanukkah candles? Beishelel, which is what we do, says you go up. One, then two, one to eight. Beit Shammai says you start with eight and go down. We'll talk later about exactly what the Machlokah says, but one of the reasons the Gemara gives for Beit Shammai is you want to follow the pattern of the Korbanot of Sukkot that go down in order. And all the commentaries try to understand what on earth is the connection between the Korbanos of Sukkot and the lighting of Hanukkah candles. So this is a good example where Sefer HaMakabim can actually shed light on what Beit Shammai is saying. This may be the only remembrance of the old connection between Hanukkah and Sukkot that the Hadlaka Saneros were designed to replicate the pattern of the Karbanot of Sukkot. So even though Chazal absolutely obliterated any idea that you, you do lulav, you do sukkah, that, that never became part of our Messiah, and it's not even recorded in the Gemara at all. It's only from the Book of the Maccabees. But in Beit Shammai, at least, I think there's a preservation of this connection. So that shows you something. You know, the Book of the Maccabees is not studied in yeshivas. So the commentaries and the Meforshim have all sorts of pilpolistic pil, pil, reasons and the like. But sometimes uh, historical facts can shed a great deal of light on why these things are. Now, so Maccabees 1 says the eight days of Hanukkah is Hanukkah Tabayat. Maccabees 2 says the eight days of Hanukkah is a makeup for Sukkot. Neither of them gives the reason of the Pach Hashemin. And the al also does not give the reason of the Pach Hashemin. Uh, in fact, uh, all three of these sources don't even mention that you light candles. Now, a later source is Josephus. Now, uh, who is Josephus? Josephus already is, is not, is, is way after the Hanukkah story. Josephus lived at the time of the Chorban of the second base of Mikdash, the year 70, right? Maccabees is around the 180s BC. So this is more than 250 years later. Uh, but Josephus wrote a number of books. Again, his original language was probably, I mean, uh, well, his own language is Hebrew, but he probably wrote uh, his works in Greek uh, or maybe Latin, and they were translated. And by the way, there's a lot of bibliography here. You sometimes see a book called Sefer Yosephon. And Yosephon is quoted by Rashi and, and the Rishonim and, and the like. Uh, again, Sefer Yosephon is a Hebrew medieval adaptation and reworking of Josephus. It is not a work of Josephus himself, uh, but it is anonymous author. The actual author of Sefer Yosephon is unknown, uh, even though it says, uh, you know, it, it says Yosef Ben Gurion, but there's no there's no such person as Yosef Ben Gurion. Josephus' name was Yosef Ben Matisyahu. A Kohen. Not the Hanukkah Matisio, but, uh, but uh, Josephus was a Kohen, Yosef ben Matisio a Kohen. And Sefer Yosephon was kind of taking Josephus, doing it in Hebrew, but with a lot of additions, Midrashim and, and the like. Again, it's an interesting, interesting book. So the Rishinim knew Josephus' writings primarily through Yosephon, uh, although some have posited that there was Josephus, did have a Hebrew original, but as far as we know, that is totally lost. In Sefer uh, Josephus, he writes about the Maccabean Rebellion. And it's interesting, he even says that among the Jews, this holiday is called Chag HaUrim, the holiday of lights, which is, you know, in Israel, that's often the modern term that they use. It comes from Josephus. So you'd figure, oh, 
So Josephus is going to connect it to uh, the miracle of the Pach Hashem. He doesn't bring it either. He, he says, oh, you know why it's called Chag Urim? Because it was the minog of Jews when they celebrated a military victory, they would light torches and fires, and therefore the candle lighting uh, was to commemorate Nitzachon. So even the candle lighting, according to Josephus, is commemorating Nitzachon and not commemorating uh, Pach Hashem. So uh, as an aside, I'll get back to where, where did the Pach Hashem thing come from. But with all of this background, we actually have a uh, really a, a beautiful answer to the very, very famous question of Rav Yosef Cairo, of the Beis Yosef. This is one of the most famous questions, that probably is the most famous question about Hanukkah. And the question is, if they found enough oil that uh, it could burn for one day, and a miracle happened that the oil burned for more than one day, for eight days, then the miracle of Hanukkah is only seven days, not eight days. So we ought to start lighting the candles the 26th of Kislev for seven days. There is no miracle on the first day. This is called the Beis Yosef's Kasha. And the Beis Yosef himself gives some answers. He says, well, the first day they only poured in one-eighth of the oil. They wanted to conserve it and because uh, they wanted to light a little bit every day. And the miracle was that even on the first day it burnt. Or they emptied the whole jar and they saw it was still filled, right? So there are different answers. And I tell you, this is something which, talk about inflation, Torah inflation. Uh, there are, you know, I remember there used to be 100 answers to this question. Then some other book comes out with 500 answers to this question. And then someone just told me there's another book with 1,000 answers to this question, right? So answer after answer after answer after answer uh, comes up. But these, once again, history can help you a lot here because... The Beis Yosef's kasha is only a kasha if the reason Hanukkah is eight days is because of the miracle of the oil. Because then you can ask the kasha, there was no miracle on the first day. But if the eight days of Hanukkah is because of the dedication of the Mishkan, or the, uh, no, like the dedication of the Mishkan, or the eight days of Hanukkah is to make up for Sukkot, then that's fine. The fact that there was no miracle of the oil, that does not affect why Hanukkah is eight days. So the truth of the matter is, history is a, is a big deal, actually. I, I uh, think that a lot of passages in Chazal, if you want to understand Gemaras and things like that, if you know the historical background, sometimes from non-standard sources, let it be Josephus, let it be Philo, uh, let it be uh, the books of the Maccabees, the Apocrypha, you know, uh, I think you can gain a lot of a lot of things. Now, people sometimes say, well, no, how can you read the Apocrypha? You're not allowed to read the Apocrypha. These are called Svarim Chitzonim. And Rabbi Akiva says, anyone who reads Svarim Chitzonim, ain lo chelek liolam haba. So how can I read the Apocrypha? Svarim Chitzonim, ain lo chelek liolam haba. But the answer is, there are many different types of books in the Apocrypha. Um, meaning, Svarim Chitzonim is not all it's not all sinister. Sometimes it just means it's excluded from Tanakh because it's not Kaddosh. Uh, there are historical books, and then there are philosophical books, and then there are religious books. And Chazal had a problem that some of the religious books espouse doctrines that are uh, connected, connected to Christianity or Avodah Zorah or the like. So they were not condemning the historical books. In fact, the Rishonim do quote Sefer HaMakabim. Right? The Rishonim do quote it, as well as Sefer Yosefin, which is based on Josephus. So uh, not all Svarim Chitzainim are condemned as Svarim Chitzainim. Right? Some are, but uh, Sefer HaMakabim is considered to be a, a source of history. As they say, uh, unless you're a military historian, it may give you more detail than you might be interested in. It really goes through every single Milchama. And it was a 25-year war, right? It wasn't, it wasn't a, short, a short war. Uh, so we basically usually go over the shorter version of it. Uh, but as a source of history, it is considered to be reliable. So where do we get the story of the Pach Hashem? So the first source that records the miracle that a jar of oil was found that... Uh, that was only one day's worth, and it burnt for, for eight days, 
is in a sefer called Megillas Tanis. Now let me explain what that is a little bit. Uh, Megillas Tanis uh, is actually the first work of Torah Shabal Peh that was written down. Remember, the oral law was normally not written down. Uh, and the Mishnah, for example, was completed by Rav Yudah Hanasi around the year 200 of the Common Era. That's after the Bar Kochba revolt. Megillas Tainus is like 100 years earlier. So you're dealing with 100, the year 100, let, let's say, which is you know, after the Chorban, but before the Mishnah. And this is actually the earliest work of the oral law that was written down. And Megillas Tainus literally means it, the scroll, the scroll of fast days. It's a very misleading title. It actually is a listing of days where you're not allowed to fast. There were certain festive days that in honor of Hashem making a Yeshua, you're not allowed to fast. Now, Megillah's Tainus does not include Shabbos, Rosh Chodesh, or Yom Tov. Those, we, we know you're not allowed to fast, but these are various later events that occurred. In fact, you'd be surprised. Um, there are like 35 holidays in Megillah's Tainus, or more, more than 30 holidays in Megillah's Tainus, which you don't, you're not allowed to fast. Uh, among them are Hanukkah and Purim, but, but the, Hanukkah and Purim are the, are the survivors. They remain as days we don't fast, but there are plenty of others. And in the Megillah's Tainus rendition of Hanukkah, it talks about the Nitzachon, and it talks about the rededication of the temple, and it mentions the miracle of the Pach Hashemen. Now, remember that the story of Hanukkah happened approximately, I'm, I'm being approximate here, 180 BCE, all my dates are approximate. Megillah's Tainus is 100 CE, so Megillah's Tainus is 280 years after the story of Hanukkah. So the first written record of the miracle of the Pach Hashemen is almost 300 years after the miracle itself. Now, I want to be very, very clear. I am not saying, God forbid, it didn't happen. Some academics will say that. Some academics will say, I'm just being honest with you, that the Pach Hashem is a made-up story. I think a religious Jew does not believe that. A religious Jew believes that, that if our Chazal recorded the miracle as a miracle, it happened. But the question becomes, if it did happen, why was it not recorded earlier? And the answer has, actually could be very simple, that this was kind of a secret miracle. Who knew about it? Where is the Menorah kept? The Menorah is kept in the Heichal, in the Beis HaMikdash. The only people who are allowed to go into the Heichal are Kohanim. And a Kohanim walks into the Heichal. I mean, think about this. You're not going to know there was a miracle. I walk into the Heichel, I'm a Kohen, let's say. I see the menorah burning. Well, the menorah was lit every day. In other words, I'm not necessarily even going to know unless I'm there 24-7 and nobody was there 24-7. You're not even going to know that there was a miracle. And certainly the, the Jews who never frequented the Heichel, you know, wouldn't know. So in many, many ways, the miracle of the Pach Hashemen was not necessarily even widely known. Apparently, it was a Messiah, it was a tradition that Yechidim had, that they passed down, and eventually Chazal saw it necessary to record it and change the emphasis of Hanukkah. So, in a sense, Hanukkah has version one and then version two. Version one of Hanukkah was not a celebration of the Pach Hashemin. It was a celebration of the Nitzachon over the Yavanim. It was a celebration over the rededication of the Beis HaMikdash. It was a celebration of the resurgence of Torah. Again, it's a spiritual victory and, and, and the like. We were not celebrating the Pach Hashemin, and it's not even clear that we were lighting candles at that time. Josephus suggests yes for another reason that was part of celebrating the victory. 
By the time Megillus Tainus came around, 100, after the Churban Beis HaMikdash, all of a sudden there's a new emphasis, a new angle to Hanukkah, and the new angle is the miracle of the Pach Hashemin. Again, again, I'm not saying, I am not saying it is made up. It always existed as a miracle, but it was not the reason for the holiday. It's only from Megillus Tainus onward that it became the reason, or at least a reason for the Chag. And one might suggest, once again, I think history is an important lesson here. And that is the glorification of the overthrow of foreign domination was not a politically correct holiday when we are in Roman domination after the Chorban of the Beis HaMikdash. So let's imagine this. You're living in Eretz Yisrael that has been decimated with the Chorban Beis HaMikdash. And later, Bar Kokhba, a few years later, the Bar Kokhba revolt. You're lighting Hanukkah candles. A Roman guy walks by and says, why are you lighting those candles? So you're going to say, we're doing it to commemorate the overthrow of the foreign occupiers of Eretz Yisrael, <laughs> which is exactly what the Romans are. So as a result, Chazal thought, let's emphasize a different aspect of the Neros, not the Josephus celebration of military victory. That will keep in our tefillah. So the tefillah do talk about that, but the thing you do publicly, we will connect it to the miracle of the Pach Shemen, which is not militarily threatening. Again, history kind of redefined what you were celebrating. The other motifs don't disappear. They don't disappear. But what do you emphasize at any given, any given time, right? So that's why, now there's another reason as well, and that is, in many, many ways, the great redemption of Hanukkah was a failed experiment. It's very, very clear, as the Ramban writes, that Matisyo Ubanav were tzaddikim, they were chasid elyon. They were very, very righteous people. And they were not fighting for political freedom. The revolt of the Maccabees was not just to be free, but it was, as the Alanism says, the Ivanim wanted to take us away from Torah. And we fought to be able to reestablish Torah. And the truth of the matter is that the Maccabim were considered to be fanatics even by their co-religionists. Many, many Jews, maybe most of the Jewish people, thought the Maccabees were crazy. They saw Hellenism as a very good development. It represented progress. It represented the best of the civilization of the ancient world. These Maccabees were the, the Haredim of the time, of the first century, uh, going backwards in time. So the Maccabees were great Sadiq. But what happened was, uh, you know, that they became the very enemy that they were fighting against. They established a Malchus for over a hundred years called Malchus Hashmainai, the Hasmonean monarchy. And eventually, what did they become? They became Hellenists. Alexander Yanai, all of these different people. In fact, the only good, uh, this is interesting, the only good ruler uh, of the Hashmonaim was a woman, Shalom Sion Hamalka. Uh, and she was the one who protected the Chachamim and allowed Torah to flourish. Uh, before her, her husband was a great persecutor of the Chachamim and he died. And her children, unfortunately, became great persecutors of the Chachamim. But her 10 year reign was considered to be the golden age from a Torah perspective. Her brother was Shimon ben Shetach, her brother was the head of the Sanhedrin, etc. Uh, so, in many, many ways, the notion that we should celebrate the defeat of the Yavanim kind of rang hollow in light of the fact that the Malchus that replaced it became Hellenistic as well. And that's why in, in Chazal's chronology, you know, when they count uh, the Golas of Babylon, the Golas of Persia, the Golas of Yavan, the Golas of Rome, they don't make a break, Malchus Chashmunoi, in the middle, even though technically that was Jewish independence. They consider Malchus Chashmunoi as part of Golis Yavan. They were Yavanim, with, who happened, they were Yavanim who happened to be Jewish. 
Uh, so it could very well be. That's why we switch it to a spiritual miracle, a miracle of Neros instead of a miracle of, of Nitzachan. So Hanukkah is a very, very fascinating holiday in that, in that particular way. And it could very well be, as I'm pointing out, that the meaning of Hanukkah changed in time. Not totally, meaning every, every aspect of it still remains, but what comes to the forefront, what comes to the back, and the like. So that, that was really the first point. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's connected. It's a little complicated. It's connected to the fact that uh, people were tame from Nochama. They were in contact with dead bodies. And therefore, they needed to wait seven days so they could make the oil with purity. That, that, was, the, that was the issue. Uh, and that's the whole question, because the halacha is that uh, the communal lighting of the nara can be done with tamay oil. So what's the problem? Okay, but that, that's a famous question. But nevertheless, uh, they, they wanted to wait till they were tar before they made the oil. So it took seven days to become tar, and then they would make the oil, uh, and the oil would be, uh, would be, would be tar. Now, uh, one uh, point here, and that is um, when the Gemara and Shabbos discusses the laws of Hanukkah, this is in Masechah Shabbos, right after it discusses lighting Shabbos candles, it discusses Hanukkah candles. Oh, by the way, I have to tell you a, a little, little, a nice little story. It's a digression, but it's a, it's a beautiful Misa. There was um, a, a, a man in Europe, um, end of the 19th century, uh, was a tremendous, tremendous tzaddik. His name was Rav Nochem Kaplan, and he was known as Rav Nochemka. Uh, Rav Nochemka. And um, he he was a big Talmud Chacham, but he never took a job as a Rav or a Rosh Hashiva. He was a Shamish in a show, and that's all he wanted. He just wanted to be a Shamish. Extraordinary for his Anova, for his modesty. He was like a pre Chafetz Chaim, Chafetz Chaim. In fact, the Chafetz Chaim, as a young man, gravitated to Rav Nachum. A lot of the Chafetz Chaim simplicity was modeled on the way Rav Nachum lived. And the Chafetz Chaim used to just hang around Rav Nachum. His, his, Chafetz Chaim was drawn to his humility, his simplicity, the fact that his whole life was devoted to helping people and never, without any recognition, without anyone knowing about him, uh, etc., so the Chavitz Chaim noticed he was, he was with him the first night of Hanukkah. And, you know, in, in Lithuania, and this is the Minigan Eretz Yisrael, people are very, very mocked based on the Vilna Gaon, that you have to light your Hanukkah Neros within a half an hour of nightfall. You have to, otherwise you don't even make a bracha. We don't pass in that way, but this is the Vilna Gaon Shita. You must light within the half an hour, no matter what. So if your family is not there, you do it without your family. So the Chavitz Chaim noticed that Rav Nachumka was simply, you know, taking his time. There was no particular rush. And finally, the Chavitz Chaim said, you know, Rebbe, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't we light? So Rav Nachumka said, my Rebbe isn't here yet. So the Chavitz Chaim says, I understand, but the halacha is, you light, and you're Yotze, the people that come later. Right? You don't have to wait till everybody's there. So Rav Nachumka said, the Gemara says the following. The Gemara says, that if you only have enough money to buy Shabbos candles or Hanukkah candles, you only have enough money, which Neros have priority? So the halacha is the Shabbos candles have priority over the Hanukkah candles. Why? Because the Shabbos candles you're permitted to eat by. You can, they illuminate your meal. Hanukkah candles you're not allowed to uh, eat by, unless you have a Shabbos, but, but you're not allowed to eat by. So Chazal say, Shabbos candles promote Shalom bias because uh, life is more pleasurable and enjoyable when we can eat by the light. So Shalom bias overrides the mitzvah of Hanukkah. So Rav Nachlikov said, if the pshat is that the Shalom bias of Shabbos candles is more important than Hanukkah, Kal v'chomer, if my wife isn't here at all and she would be very hurt by not being there when I light the Hanukkah candles. So even if I'm losing the mitzvah in a sense, like the Gra, like the Vilna Gaon, the Sholem Bayis is more important. And the Chavitz Chaim used to tell this story. Now, is this Halakha Lamaitra? Because I, I still, to this very day, I get this Shiloh all the time. Uh, guys say, well, my wife is not going to be home till 10 o'clock or whatever it is. Should I light early? 
<laughs> well, again, this you can't really paskin from stories. But according to this story, you wait until uh, your wife is home uh, because Shalom Bias overrides uh, the proper way of lighting the Hanukkah candles. Okay. But be this it may, the uh, Gemara discusses uh, there are three ways of fulfilling the mitzvah of lighting Hanukkah candles. There is what you call basic, there is what you call mahadrin, and there is what you call mahadrin, mina mahadrin. It's like restaurants, right? There's <laughs> Rabbanot Kashras, and then mahudaret, and then mahadrin, right? So this is called mahadrin, mahadrin, mina mahadrin. And this is very surprising, because basic is very different than we do it. Basic simply means I light one candle for everybody in my house, every single night of Hanukkah. So let's imagine I have a household of 10 people, me, my wife, eight children, okay? That would mean night one, I light one candle. That's it. Night eight, I light one candle. That's it. If you just light one candle a night, that covers everybody in your household. You are Yotze, the basic mitzvah of Hanukkah. Mahadrin, if I want to do more, I want to do the mitzvah in a more beautiful way. So it's still not what we do. I light one candle for every member of my household. That would mean, again, with my example of 10, day one, I light 10 neirot. And day eight, I light 10 neirot. That's still not what we do. But then there's super duper level. You want to be Mahadrin. Min a Mahadrin. So then we get to the Machlokas, Be'i Shammai and Be'i Silel, where you want to pick up the days. According to Be'i Shammai, start with eight and go down. According to Hillel, Be'i Silel, you start with one and go up. And of course, as is almost always the case, in a machlokas between Beis Hillel and Beis Shammai, we follow Beis Hillel. Now, there's an interesting machlokas. How do you integrate level two with level three? Meaning like this. Let's assume I want to do the mitzvah in the best way. And so I want to light, let's say like Beis Hillel, I want to light according to the days. Do I just do one? Or do I do it for every member of my family? This is a machlokas Ashkenazim and Svardim. Svardim, Rav Yosef Cairo actually paskins. If you're doing the highest level, you don't do the middle level. Meaning, according to Svardim, you only light one menorah. And the reason they say that is, the whole purpose of the highest level is that you should be proclaiming the number of days. But the argument goes, if there's like a million menorahs in the window, people walk by, you know, they don't know, 50 candles, you know, they might not know the number of days. So Bedavka, if you clearly want to emphasize the number of days, you don't have every member of the family light, okay? That is the sheet of Svardim, that is the sheet of Rav Yosef Cairo. But the Ramah says the minag of Ashkenazim is that if you want to do the highest level, you incorporate the middle level as well so that every member of the family, and we'll discuss maybe next week as we're out of town, every member of, out of time rather, every member of the family should light a menorah. So if you're doing mahadrin, mina mahadrin, according to Ashkenazim, you also do mahadrim. But then we'll discuss, does that include husband and wife? Does that include uh, daughters generally? There are different minhagim about that. Some say, even like the Ramah, a husband and wife only have one menorah. Although some, some say two. Uh, and uh, Hassam Seifer even says that the custom is that women do not light a separate... Now again, if a woman is by herself, she of course has to light. Remember we talked about that. A woman is chayevet in her Hanukkah. The only question is, the mahadrin, mina mahadrin... The Chassam Seifer claims uh, does not include women. But we'll, we'll talk next week uh, more be Arichas. Anyone wish you well, uh, Hanukkah Sameach.
and uh, Be'ezrat Hashem will be your next. Uh, next before we all take off, just.